Yeah, good. I like these things because you're not chasing your ass around the United States. You're in one place for a finite period of time, and all you guys are here, and so it's not. It doesn't become this crazy chase. You know, like when you do, like when we do those, uh, you know, junkets for a movie. You talk. Hopefully, you're proud of. It. The only time these things suck is if, we, if the project you have sucks. Then you got to lie, <laughs> and you know, you got to show up and do your thing. But if something's good, it's a piece of cake, and Stan's great. Yeah. Great. We all think so. What's your favorite thing about playing Stan? Just he's the least full of shit person I've ever met. And so, whereas Dr. Cox was a little full of himself and full of shit, Stan's not. Stan's a damaged guy. He's wounded. His wife just died. He got fired from his job at 27 years. The two things that grounded him on the planet are gone. And so he's injured. And so it's fun to explore injured men for, for me. It's a great moment too where he comes home and he reaches for his wife's keys. This is one of the moments kind of ground the show, I think. I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the New York Times said the same thing you did. And in post, as one of the producers, I can try to fight for stuff that is important to me. And everybody kept saying, it's, it's too sad in the first act. I'm like, no, you're, you're wrong. It's the most important thing in the whole show. It'll ground... Look, the only reason we forgive Archie Bunker is his racism, his quasi-racism, and his sexism is because of Edith. Because Edith, Edith's love validates our <laughs> And Stan needs his forgiveness is because A, he's injured, and B, he loves his wife more than oxygen. And I said, he has to reach for that thing. She's gone. There's an absence. This is a wounded guy. I said, and so season two, Stan tries to get his wife back. He's been dead either. So if the Uber objective for Stan last year was to always be in that recliner watching the History Channel and drinking beer, so anytime he wasn't in that recliner, he was in the wrong place, the wrong kind. In other words, he, he doesn't know his ass and his elbow fighting witches. Probably didn't even believe in him. And so, you know, when he takes a pipe to a witch's head, what else do you do? He didn't know what else to do. He's a fucking witch. <laughs> and so... This year, so the Uber objective is to get whole, and the only way you can get whole is to get Claire back, but she's been dead. Again. So now some super secret shit comes in, and that's pretty delicious. So we get more of an emotional arc for him. And so your question about t your question about touching the key, you know, her missing keychain, to me. I mean, it's a great observation. To me, it anchored the whole season. Are those moments written in the script, or did, were they on the fly? Absolutely written in the script. But in post-production, where everybody is Orson Welles, um, <laughs> you have to protect stuff. You have to come up with two or three things that we're not going to compromise on. And so maybe we'll compromise on... Maybe, maybe the walk into the house was really important at that pace. Well, the show is 21 minutes and 35 seconds. You got to chop the walk a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, hypothetical, but there's a couple of things you got to just uh, hold on to, and that's why I wanted to be. I didn't want to be. I insisted on being one of the producers on this, just because I had a post-production company in New York in the Brill Building for about 10 years, and I produced five movies, and I, I, I want to be able to participate in post and in shaping the scripts. During this thing, I'm just going to be the actor. But in, in pregame and in post, you want me involved because I'm going to make your life easier. Plus, I have a photographic memory for everything that happened on the set. For stuff maybe the editor missed, and go, you should go to the end of the fourth take. There's this really, really special little thing. Just, just humor me and go to the the end of that fourth take. It's like, oh, I didn't see that. I'm like, of course you didn't see it. <laughs> And so then, that, I'm, just ma I'm making you, the editor's life, 5% easier. And it's preposterous that Stan is shot eight episodes in five weeks. I mean, that's preposterous. That's insane. <laughs> it's insane. Yeah. And, uh, but what it's bred, and so I had, it was so funny, I had, and she won't get mad at me for telling you this, but the head of IFC, an incredible woman named Jennifer Serta, and I saw Jen at uh, Sundance this year, and we've become friends, and she's been a champion of the show. And I said, 
I know you guys have done a great job with Stan, and you, you have championed it. And I said, could we add a week to the production schedule? And she did the most genius poker play in the history of the world. Instead of no histrionics, no nothing, she just said, oh, no, no, no. And it completely stripped me naked. I was like, because I had all a, a litany of things to, to show you why we should get an extra week. And she absolutely crushed me. He was the most genius <laughs> poker player ever. How much uh, method acting is involved in uh, hanging out on the lounge chair and drinking beer? Else? It's not something I'm unfamiliar with. <laughs> <laughs> It would be a rocking chair for me, but uh, I'm not unfamiliar with that. I think I'm a little more physically active than Stan is. And he stands, he's tired. He's tired. He's been a cop in New England for 27 years. He's mm -hmm. tired. Uh, well, my dad retired from being a cop. That's all he did was sit in the chair and watch TV. So it's pretty... It, I don't think that's unreasonable. No. You've seen a lot, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. And he didn't go out on his terms. He went out being fired. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden... I don't. I can't say that. Some of us have been fired from different jobs, whether you know it was a high school summer job or whatever. Most of us have been fired from something, and it sucks. Mm -hmm. And there's no way you can't look at the man in the mirror every morning and go like, "Fuck, I suck." Oh, I can't believe I got fired. That's all. Yeah, you bring that. You bring that. And so that's a. I don't think he went out on his own terms. One of my favorite parts about season one was the dynamic between Stan and his daughter. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Uh, you get to have some fun with that relationship. Return to that in season two. Yes, but I think that one of the learning curves for the producers and the writers from season one is to, and this is the ultimate compliment, almost like Jonathan Winters or Don Rickles, to give Deborah's the actor, to give Deborah as much rope as she wants, and to not confine her, the actor, in too tight of a, 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 a parameters in the construct of the, of the expository part of the story. She doesn't have to do the who, what, where, when, how. Let, let her do the Jonathan Winter stuff because she's so gifted and you don't oh, thank you dear. you don't want to call cut on her but because the show is 21 minutes and 35 seconds some of Deborah's stuff which is genius uh, gets cut and so to not do that this year we kept her we catered to her strengths and she steals every scene she's in because she's amazing Yes. So what's it like um, balancing the producer role with being the lead actor and kind of the leader on set? How do you like go through balancing that? And... I think the number one thing I can do for the actors on the set is get them the scripts, eight scripts in five weeks, a month ahead of time. So I can encourage Dana to wrap things up a little bit and give the actors a chance at consuming all these words so that they can own them. So we get down to Georgia, you don't have to pull a rabbit out of a hat every waking second of every day. And so that's what I can do the most for the actors is I can, I can get them the texts early. So in other words, on Scrubs, I'd be handed a two-page single-space rant for Dr. Cox on the way to the set. And it just became panic acting, which you can do, but it's really emotionally expensive, and it's a panic. No one, most of us don't like to be in a panic. And so, and Billy Lawrence, who's one of my dearest friends, he just likes to write late. And then you get the scripts, and they're so good, and I'm so competitive that I wasn't going to let them write two-page single space for anybody else. And so I just, I guess you can sharpen up that memory muscle somehow. Uh, and so on Scrubs, uh, the actors got the words at the last second. And it just became an exercise in pulling out of your ass something. And someone called action. And it was very desperate. Stan doesn't have the same sense of desperation in Atlanta. It's too hard. It beats the living shit out of you. Were most of those rants pre-written? Uh, not, uh, not improvised at all? No. All I improvise is, uh, is maybe the, the suffix to something. To maybe just the out. Mm -hmm. But you got to remember, on Scrubs, before that writer's strike, 
you had 14 writers, and they would be in two different rooms, and there'd be seven in one room and seven in the other, and Billy would, uh, and they'd leapfrog episodes. So the first room would write episode 401 for season, and then they'd leapfrog, and Billy would go back and forth. Um, and to be in one of those writers' rooms, you probably were one of the editors at the Lampoon in Har at Harvard, and you were this wildly overqualified, really smart person, man or woman, and the, the, the output that was flowing from those two rooms, you damn sure better say what's on the page. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't some random collection of syllables. People killed themselves to hand you this. And so it became clear to me that you say what's written. And then if you have some flavor, it's the same way with Oliver, with Oliver Stone. You say what's written, and then if you want to bring some flavor to it, fine. Say what's on the goddamn page. And I, I love that, because it takes, it takes this huge burden off your back. Because not everybody's Jim Carrey. Jim can, and Robin could do what they could do. Nobody else can. Most of us really rely on what somebody spent an enormous amount of time putting on the page. And if it's good, it's heaven. Like what Dana puts on the page is insanely good. You want to say it. And when Billy Lawrence starts, starts putting something about, you know, Dr. Cox railing against Zach about attending a cotillion, yeah. <laughs> you want to be able to say cotillion in front of 11 million people yeah, yeah. on Thursday nights. It's great. That's good stuff. And before you came onto this, you were in the Velcro experiment, which was kind of a darker film. You've done other work like Intensity, some of my favorite films. Same here. Loved that performance, 20 year anniversary coming up too. Um, do you enjoy. I didn't like, talk to that actor for the set, and I never do this, but the, uh, Molly Parker, who's going on to have this great career. Um, I didn't talk to her for eight weeks because I didn't want to have a coffee with her and her to be comfortable. And it worked. <laughs> Yeah, and I love Molly, but I just, I got some batshit crazy idea in my head. Not to be mean to Molly, but just not to get to know her. So that at any point, you know, on the set, she just might think I was going to take a shit and stick it in an artery. And then the, the lens picks that up, and now we got something else. And I would never hurt another actor, ever. And I never have, and I never will. But I wanted the lens to suffer some kind of tension between action and fight. Yeah, I, I thought that I thought that was scary as shit. <laughs> yeah. So do you enjoy now you're on stage with people where you're doing more kind of dark stuff, but you're on the other side of the ground. You're the good guy, do you enjoy kind of spending time in these worlds where there's blood flying or there's more just kind of I don't know, I got one coming out at the beginning of September with Danny Glover about a bunch of priests. And so you know you, you go where the good scripts are. And then I got a little lead one coming out after that. You go you go where the words are on the page. I mean, I'm 57. I don't want to pull it out of my ass. It's too fucking hard. I want you to put something on the goddamn page. Otherwise, you go to the meeting, and the first thing in the meeting is like, well, John, uh, we really look forward to finding this character on the day. And I'm like, you know what's going to happen on the day? The 10K lamp's going to go out, and then you're going to be fucking worried about that. And we're not going to find this relationship between me and, and Danny Crawford. There's no one that. You know what you're going to do? You get the makeup artist had a heart attack. Now we got a fucking the actors doing no makeup. You're going to find the character. How was your time on Broadway? It was the greatest experience of my life. I, I saw it, by the way. You're great. Oh, it's made my whole day. <laughs> um, I had been, I did Requiem for a Heavyweight 25 years earlier with John Lithgow and David Crowball and almost all the Italian-American actors who go on to populate The Sopranos. And we opened on a Thursday and closed on a Saturday and broke my heart. And so when I got the call to go do Glengarry with Al and Bobby and all these great actors, it felt like as stone cold a lock as I've ever heard. And Glengarry is the greatest play written for men in our lifetimes. And uh, it was the greatest. And I functioned on fear for the first month of rehearsal. So I, I set up this theater boot camp in Malibu. And I had a, my coach come out, and I hired this kid from Pepperdine to just come and run lines. I told him, I don't want your input. You know, I gave him $20 an hour, and for three hours a day, we would run the lines. And I, I got a metronome, and we ran it at different paces. And I did everything that I could that I thought might go wrong, except for these things in the theater. I didn't anticipate <laughs> those. And... Uh, 
those are disconcerting, but it was the greatest experience of my life. By far. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I love the show. Kids great. aside. Yeah. I'm not talking about the yeah, yeah, yeah. so. Kids are all right. No, but you guys, the women do all the work. The guys are cheerleaders. And we had two home births, so. Great to see you guys. Thanks for coming. Thank you.